Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And this morning, uh, we're going to have a discussion of the RCEP. And uh, if you don't know already, you'll so soon find out what that is, uh, the new trade agreement in East Asia. And to discuss it this morning, we have Jacques Delisle, who is the director of our Asia program. He's also the Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science and director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, many of you know him, but I would also like to put in a plug for his next book, Taiwan Under Tsai, co-edited with June Teufel Dreyer, who's also one of our senior fellows. That's forthcoming in 2020. Um, before we get started, and, and Jacques also will be speaking with Shihoko Goto of the Wilson Center, who is also not a stranger to most of you on this call. Um, I'd just like to put in a quick plug for some of our upcoming events because we have a lot of terrific ones next week. Uh, we have three, anyway. We have uh, on Monday, uh, December 7th, we have, I think that's Monday, December 7th from 3 to 4 p.m., we have our one of our newest trustees, Ambassador Charles Ray, and he's also the chair of our Africa program. He's going to be talking with Ambassador um, Herman Cohen, who has uh, something like 38 years with the U.S. Foreign Service, including uh, five, uh, five tours in African countries and twice in France. And he's going to be talking about his new book, U.S. Policy Toward Africa, Eight Decades of Real Politics. Um, on December 8th, from 2 to 3 p.m., we'll have Bob Kaplan back again, uh, speaking with John Nagel about uh, the geopolitics of the, the new Biden administration and some of the key challenges they're going to be facing. Um, and finally, on December 10th, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., uh, Chris Miller, uh, the pro our program director of our Eurasia program, uh, will be talking about China's growing role in Central Asia. Uh, so those should be some really terrific, um, uh, terrific programs coming up next week. And I would also, since we have a lot of China watchers, I assume, on this call, if you missed yesterday's conversation uh, between Stephen Kotkin and um, Bob Kaplan talking about post-communist China, I strongly encourage you to listen to the video, which if it's not already up, it should be up later today on our FPRI's YouTube channel. It was a terrific conversation. Um, a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, we will be recording this program. We are recording this program right now. And so you can listen to it later online if you miss any of it or if you want to listen to it again or if you would like to share it with your friends and colleagues. Um, we will be having a Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. Please go ahead and start at, uh, adding questions to the Q&A anytime you'd like. And about halfway roughly halfway through the program, maybe a little farther, we will start asking questions. Um, finally, we'll be posting some maps in the chat window. And again, um, the Q&A box is for your questions. The chat window is for if you have any technical issues, contact us there. You can send a note privately to us and we will help you out. Uh, and we'll also be uh, posting um, maps, as I say, links to maps in the chat box. Finally, before I turn it over to Jacques, thank you to all of you, our supporters, our board members, our partners who are on this call today uh, for, for your support. We can't do what we do without you, and we are very, very grateful. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Jacques Delisle. Well, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you all for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to be here again with an old friend of FPRI and a frequent participant in our various programming, Shihoko Goto, who, as uh, Raleigh mentioned, is at the Wilson Center, where she is Deputy Director for Geoeconomics and Senior Northeast Asian Associate, uh, and is also a veteran journalist working on many of the issues that we're talking about uh, today. So today's topic, of course, is the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, this, what, this is an agreement that links together the 10 ASEAN countries plus five other countries in the Asia Pacific region, including Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, the agreement was signed uh, not long ago, 11-15, November 15th, 
just a few weeks back. And as is appropriate for the age of COVID, it was done with a simultaneous virtual signing ceremony uh, in all of the relevant capitals. It's an agreement that emerged after eight years of negotiations, which sped up, I think, notably after the U.S. opted out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and RCEP became sort of the name of the game for a mega regional trade agreement, although a revised version of the TPP, the CPTPP, alphabet soup for everyone there, uh, has, has, um, has uh, come to the fore as well with Japanese leadership. But anyway, the, the RCEP will enter into force probably in about a year or so. It's going to take a while to get uh, the relevant uh, countries to approve it. It goes into effect when six of the 10 ASEAN countries and three of the five non-ASEAN countries uh, approve it. It covers roughly 30% of global trade and roughly 30% of the world's population. It'll be the world's largest trading block. Uh, like many of these agreements, it's quite long and quite complicated. It's got 20 chapters. Uh, it deals with the usual things you find in an agreement on a trade, uh, trade in goods, including tariff reduction, uh, rules on the so-called rules of origin, which determine whether goods get uh, treated as being from within the block, uh, harmonization of customs rules, trade promotion efforts, rules on things like a sanitary and phylosanitary, which basically health restrictions on trade, uh, technical barriers to trade, dispute resolution, and it goes beyond the trade in goods to a bunch of other subject matters, many of which have been built into the WTO system over the years, including trade and services, regulations on investment to liberalize investment environments, intellectual property, competition law, government procurement, and then some newfangled things like e-commerce and some rules on the temporary movement of people of labor across borders. It avoids a few things that have been on the global or regional trade agenda in recent years, things like labor standards, uh, restrictions on state subsidies, environmental protection, human rights related issues, things like that. So that's a quick overview. Uh, Shaho, could I leave anything important out of the list of what's in the uh, RCEP in that uh, quick summary? No, I, I think um, that's a really good lay of the land of what RCEP actually means. Um, just what it actually means for the United States is that the United States was never supposed to be part of RCEP. And that wasn't going to be a problem because the United States was already part of the other uh, regional trade agreement, TPP, now known as CPTPP. And T CPTPP ha it has a higher standard job. You mentioned uh, some of the things that RCEP does not cover, um, including things like um, uh, keeping tabs on state-owned enterprises. Um, TPP would have done that, CPTPP does that, TPP would have done that, the United States decided to withdraw from it. So the end result is that here are two big regional trade agreements, um, neither of which the United States is part of. And with RCEP's deal, uh, the Chinese certainly are, uh, have ballyhooed that this is a big win for them. And that is certainly the angle that the US media has taken on as well. But I do want to push back on that idea a little bit and say, it's not really an, I, a big victory for China per se, but it really certainly is a big win for Asia. Because what it does mean is that here's a framework that was um, established on a multilateral front by Asians for Asians. And so we have a trade regime where the rules are being set for by end Asians. And it offers this opportunity for networking, not just to get this across the finish line. Remember that the member countries of this are very disparate, not just only on their economic standing. You have really poor countries like Laos and Cambodia, um, together with countries like China and Japan and Korea. And they're all coming together uh, with a common um, incentive to actually pursue a common trade framework. Um, and it also highlights the fact that during the last four years in particular, as the United States, as well as much of Europe, especially the United Kingdom, is taking a much more unilateral protectionist approach uh, to trade and taking a very anti-globalist stance towards you know, international cooperation and the likes, Asia has really embraced this idea of going multilateral, that there is uh, strength in numbers, that there are opportunities to uh, put aside some of their differences and focus on common and shared interests. So that these are, so it has not just the economic 
um, impetus. Um, I should also add that according to some estimates, um, but within the next decade, RCEP will add about 147 billion to the regional region's income levels. Um, TPP is supposed to add about 186 billion during that same time. So together, CPTPP and RCEP will offset a lot of the losses, not just from the ongoing US-China trade war or um, the US tariffs that are currently being imposed. So it's a big deal both for the economies, but it also has given great confidence to Asians to imagine a world order without the United States. So a lot of people are imagining that now. So just to, to pick up on a couple of those uh, threads, I mean, the, the, the comparison and the relationship between the CPTPP, the former TPP, uh, and RCEP, uh, it's kind of interesting. There, there is overlapping membership, of course. Uh, the common members are Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and the more developed states in ASEAN to a significant degree, so Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and then Vietnam, kind of a complicated case, but, but, but certainly a, a pretty dynamic economy. Uh, then you've got the other ASEAN six countries plus China and South Korea in the RCEP, but not in the TPP or the CPTPP. And in the, C in the TPP, you have the uh, Eastern Pacific countries, Canada, Mexico, Chile, Peru, and would have been the United States. So it's kind of an interesting Venn diagram. Uh, so, as you, so although the, the CPTPP is geographically diverse, both sides of the Pacific, the RCEP is a lot more economically and politically diverse. It's got a much bigger mix of systems, much bigger mix of, of levels of economic development, especially if you sort of said Vietnam to one side as one of the common uh, members. And as you say, the, the Asian-centric uh, quality of this is really uh, quite uh, striking. And, we'll, and we'll, we'll loop back to some of the, the geopolitics of this <clears throat> in a moment, but I, I want to probe a little more on the economic impact. As you said, it's estimated to have you know, anywhere from the mid 100 billions to on some estimates up to 200 billion over, over a decade long period in terms of impact on GDP of the member countries, roughly the same range uh, as uh, what you uh, see from the TPP a little bit less. And uh, by some estimates, uh, several hundred billion up to half a trillion in impact on world trade uh, volume. So, um, you know, how big a deal is this uh, economically? Why does it make an economic difference, given that some of these countries already had free trade arrangements, or at least quite liberal trade arrangements among them. It's yeah, people often refer to the Asian trading agreement uh, profile, the landscape as being a noodle bowl, right? A lot of these uh, regional agreements and the RCEP is supposed to bring it together. So how much difference does it make? Which countries does it have the biggest impact on? Uh, leaving aside the impact on the US being outside within the region, who, who are the biggest winners uh, from uh, RCEP integration. Yeah, so I would summarize the benefit of this in one word, and it would be efficiency. So there's going to be a lot of um, cutting of red tape, um, right? Uh, of course, RCEP has been criticized not just for its lower standards compared to CPTPP, but also because it sim simply consolidates some of the um, existing uh, bilateral as well as minilateral deals um, in the region. But it all comes together under one roof. And so when you talked about you know, the rule of origin, for instance, uh, the rule of origin is that if a project, 40% of uh, the, the components of a product is made within the member countries of RCEP, they would be treated as a domestically produced good. And so there would be no tariff barriers on that product. Um, given some exceptions, of course. And again, there is this um, timeline of when this will actually be introduced, but the end goal is precisely that, that it would have this one blanket, one rule approach for all these 15 countries, which actually means that not only do they have to do less paperwork uh, to move goods across borders, um, it, that also means that it cuts back on uh, personnel costs, and it really cuts down on a lot of investment costs as well. So you see uh, big uh, countries like Japan and their corporate leadership really welcoming this, but regarding which countries would actually benefit the most, so we have this Venn diagram of uh, com uh, countries which are members of both RCEP and CPTPP, 
Um, and you see, I would say that the ones uh, that are um, emerging markets uh, that are members to both uh, would be particularly uh, would benefit particularly from this agreement. So, and in particular, it would be Vietnam. Vietnam is always going to be one of the biggest gainers of CPTPP. It's certainly a big gainer in RCEP as well. So, yeah, but as you, from a US perspective, you could argue that it's, you know, it's a communist country. It doesn't necessarily follow market rules. However, this is an opportunity for Vietnam to really embrace that and it would have, its people will have something to show for it as well. So uh, the biggest economies in this uh, RCEP agreement, of course, are uh, China, Japan, and Korea, and they have not previously had FTA-like agreements among themselves. China has one with ASEAN, and indeed, having a free trade agreement with ASEAN was a precondition uh, for joining RCEP. It's one of the reasons the U.S. could not uh, be in it from the beginning. Uh, but, but so how big a deal is this for the, for the uh, always just over the horizon goal of removing the barriers uh, for trade among China, Japan, and Korea? Right. So it's estimated that about, you know, once this is actually put into place, uh, tariffs um, between Japan, China, and Korea will be lifted by about 90 percent, and that's pretty significant, right? Um, but also bear in mind, though, that China and Korea have already had a bilateral trade agreement, but it's been pretty low standard and it hasn't really encouraged any uh, significant uh, jump in, in trade relations, which have already always been quite robust. Um, but what this does do is that it gives a bilateral trade agreement between Japan and China on the one um, It gives a trade agreement between Japan and China as well as Japan and Korea, and it, le it can lead to a trilateral Japan-Korea, uh, Japan-Korea-China uh, free trade agreement as well. So RCEP as a concept um, has been in existence for about a decade. Negotiations have been ongoing for eight years, and this is the fruit of eight years of very hard negotiations. But the trilateral CJK, China, Japan, Korea deal has actually been in negotiation or floated as an idea and really discussed at length since 2002. And it's still not uh, moving forward. So there's a lot of speculation that perhaps RCEP will allow this trilateral to actually um, be formed at the end of, you know, a little bit more negotiation. Um, but perhaps the most significant thing, um, apart from the facilitation of trade relations as a result of RCEP, is that it overcomes a lot of um, political hurdles that the three countries have. Let me just look at um, the Japan-Korea angle first. Uh, Japan and Korea's um, relations over the past two years in particular have been incredibly tense. Some have described it as the worst since relations have been normalized in 1965. Um, there's a lot of uh, concern. Uh, one concern is that Korea is um, demanding wartime compensation for its laborers during World War II and um, threatening to seize Japanese assets in Korea in order to pay for that. Uh, Japan has retaliated um, by imposing import uh, export restrictions on some critical goods that are needed to make um, semiconductors, um, which are needed by the Korean manufacturers. So these tensions are ongoing. These real trade disputes are not are not have not been uh, have not been conditional for them to enter RCEP. So these are still ongoing, and yet these two countries under a multilateral umbrella were able to shove their differences and come together and, and sign on to RCEP. The expectation is that tensions will remain, but um, there should hopefully uh, be no new additional tariffs or no new additional economic threats, and that this could potentially lead to an enhanced dialogue between the two sides. Um, and I, I also want to point out um, one of the interesting things um, in the 20 chapters of RCEP and the, and the very last one about what things, uh, issues to consider moving forward is that RCEP is considering establishing a secretariat. And establishing a secretariat should not be an exciting deal, but it could be. It could be because 
um, it, it allows a permanent housing of, uh, of a place for these countries to continue discussing some of the issues, the sticking points, you know, including implementation, implementation of the rules um, so that there can be this place where they can actually go to, to address their grievances. Uh, but at the same time, one of the challenges, of course, is not um, the lifting of tariffs, but establishing rules in new emerging industries, um, and especially um, rules for the non-manufacturing, uh, non-goods sector. And right now, when we look at it globally, there really isn't a lot of places that we can turn to for establishment of rules on e-commerce and on data technology and the like. If we look at the WTO right now, it is, you know, uh, to be blunt, in crisis. Um, there is um, the, the leadership challenge continues to be in flux. Um, there is also a lot of concern about how countries are assessed to be emerging countries or industrialized countries, um, things like that. And here is an opportunity for RCEP to say, we're going to establish the secretariat. We're going to establish this as a way to put forward our rules, but we're also going to use this as a forum to address some of our future needs um, and to address future challenges, which is not available anywhere else. So that, that gets us into one of uh, the issues, I think, that has loomed over this whole uh, paralysis in the WTO, the pursuit of mega regional trade agreements like TPP or RCEP, which is, you know, what's the best thing for the beleaguered rules-based international order, right? We've heard a lot about that and how the Trump era uh, has had the U.S. no longer being the principal supporter of that, uh, but indeed an underminer. And then uh, where do we go from this? Okay, there are a few strands to pull on here. One, to loop back to something you said earlier, which is the importance of this RCEP agreement. Uh, efficiency is one point, and, and, and um, there's sort of a broader harmonization story here. I mean, but for people who aren't trade junkies, uh, one of the things that gets lost is people look at the free trade agreements, the bilateral trade agreements that litter the landscape out there, and they're actually not very heavily utilized. Uh, because when you've got complicated global value chains, global production chains, it gets maddeningly complicated to, to bring your products in to, meet, to get the certain benefits of one bilateral agreement, and then they cross the border to another country. So a lot of these go underutilized. And what something like RCEP does is by bringing this together, by establishing a sort of harmonization of rules of origin and other things, it really does um, bring inside the tent, as it were, a lot of steps in the production process and you can see a higher utilization thing and it reduces the ability to engage in bilateral sort of tit for tat trade disputes because you've got this larger framework so there's some gains there but you've pointed to another piece of this which is it's not just that it's writing more rules and rules that are more likely to be used to have real world impacts there is this institutional side of it so if you create a secretary if you create a dispute resolution arrangement then we do have a rules-based international order at least for a region um, so yeah, anything you want to respond to in that, but I'd also say sort of where does this leave us? Because as we've looked at the transition from the Trump administration, which has been skeptical of trade agreements, which has been bilateralist or unilateralist, and we look toward a Biden administration, which is at least more open to multilateralism, uh, is something like RCEP a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a welcome substitute for a stalled uh, WTO arrangement? Is it a rival to a CPTPP? Um, or should we just say, hey, better to have some rules than no rules, and this at least is a step in the right direction, even if it's not as liberal as we want it to be, even if uh, we're on the outside, at least for the time being? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, stepping back on, you know, what the Biden administration be pursuing in terms of trade agreements and um, trade relations, right, the question is really going to be, what does the United States want? Um, from the region, what kind of economic partnerships does it want? And I think a lot of those um, who have um, worked in the Obama administration and are expected to join the Biden administration in one capacity or another really focus on this idea that Biden will be much more of an internationalist, that he is going to go much more for a uh, conciliatory approach and establish coalitions um, uh, with like-minded countries. 
And that's all very good and well, but <clears throat> unlike on the security front, which really, you know, the end goal, I believe, would be to ensure stability in the region. When it comes to economics and especially trade relations, it, it's a race. It really is a competition. And stability is not necessarily the end goal. There is this competition for new markets uh, to keep current markets to, and also to increase market share. Um, and in, in light of that, um, how can the rules, um, how can rules help? Um, how can we ensure that the, uh, there is no distortion of markets? And I think that will be the big challenge for the Biden administration. And now, before we go into the China factor, because I know we, we really do want to talk about a lot of the Chinese competition and bringing in the coalition of the willing versus China, I do want to point out um, that RCEP was actually supposed to be a 16-member country agreement, and it was supposed to have India. And India um, was supposed to be critical uh, for the other countries, minus China, because it was an opportunity for them to balance out some of the forcefulness um, of, of China. India's decision to pull out of the RCEP deal um, was really a reflection of its domestic um, considerations, um, and certainly uh, Narendra Modi's um, uh, belief that it would um, really reduce the competitiveness of Indian exports and the Indian market would be flooded with Chinese imports uh, really resonated strongly with the Indian Indian voters. Um, but I do want to point out that um, if, in, if we want India to be a key player in the region and if we want India to be um, act as a counterbalance to China, um, this RCEP may actually be a great challenge for India because as we have these um, uh, new rules that unite the region, India is going to be out of it. India, yes, is a big provider of the, um, the pharmaceutical sector in the world, uh, but its supply chain base is really kind of limited to, to that sector um, when it comes to critical industries. And it's not going to be able to compete with China or attract new, it will find it very difficult to attract new capital um, as long as RCEP continues to really succeed. So one of the things that RCEP is doing is that um, new members can join 18 months after this agreement comes into fruition. Uh, which is really quite speedy for most trade negotiations, for most trade deals, but they're giving an exception to India. India can join any time. So there's a lot of hope that India will join, uh, but given the current political leadership in India, it's unlikely, but it, I, I think it, it would be a great benefit to India to join at this stage. Yes, well, it's kind of a global phenomenon that those with populist tendencies tend not to be huge fans of, of liberalized <laughs> trade deals. You know, and I think one thing that goes underappreciated a lot is just how much India is concerned about China's prowess in, in manufacturing and exports. I mean, this has been a, a long running issue in the sense that the Indian markets will be swamped and Indian exports will be undercut by, by Chinese alternatives. But there's another piece of the India story in RCEP, which is not just that long standing. Uh, fear and, and concern. Uh, but also India was pushing for more uh, liberalization in some of the service sectors where India has something of a comparative advantage uh, for China, and that was just hard to get that in. China, in the WTO context and other contexts, has been relatively reluctant to open uh, service sectors where foreign uh, competitors might uh, might flood in. Uh, they're not a big service exporter just yet. Um, so we, we talked about India as being the big economy that's on the outside of RCEP among the potential members. Obviously, the U.S. is a huge economy, but it's never going to be RCEP. Um, another country that's been watching the uh, CPTPP, the TPP, and the RCEP with, uh, um, I think, some degree of frustration is Taiwan. Uh, and I know you've, you've covered uh, Taiwan in, in, in some of your work as well. Uh, what does this all mean for them? I mean, if you dial this back to sort of 
pre-US withdrawal from TPP, which by the way, has to be dialed back to before Trump. Trump withdrew, but the agreement was already in, in, in trouble in the United States. Uh, but you know, Taiwan's sitting around looking, saying, okay, well, we're not gonna get into either one on the first tranche, but might get into TPP in round two. Uh, RCEP, China is the great gate, gatekeeper. But now what you've got is a situation where uh, their entree into that whole area of, of more liberalized uh, trade regimes is really through ECFA, through the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement with China. Um, and they're not getting bilateral FTAs, which had been a hope. So how, how bad is this for Taiwan? How much does it compromise the you know, new southbound policy and other efforts to, to balance away from the great tractor beam that is uh, the Chinese uh, market with the re reduced uh, bilateral trade barriers between Taiwan and the mainland? How, do they, yeah. how does Taiwan come out? Okay. Yeah, so I think there is nothing more that Taiwan wants than to join both RCEP and CPTPP, but the hurdles are political rather than economic. Um, when uh, you know, joining WTO, um, the idea was that both Taiwan and China would join simultaneously. Uh, and that was then, this is now, I don't know whether if, if, if China, you know, Xi Jinping has said that China might eventually want to join CPTPP too. Um, if China were to do that, I don't think that um, China would be so conciliatory and allow Taiwan to join with it as well. But when it comes to um, you know, looking at the COVID um, performance of countries, um, Taiwan has done really incredibly well. It's got one of the lowest infection rates anywhere in the world um, because it has taken really great measures to keep the uh, pandemic at bay. And that has meant that its economy has not shut down at all. Um, and it has really uh, been able to take advantage of the fact that there is great demand for IT goods, especially semiconductors, and its economy has actually grown uh, during the pandemic, really bucking the global trend. And now we can we don't know whether this is going to be a long term um, uh, development or not, but certainly Taiwan has shown that it it has really good governance and it has a robust economic policy that encourages growth. And it certainly deserves and and should be in these multilateral institutions, and it would and it would be a good player, uh, so to speak. What the but given the political hurdles that it faces, what it has been doing over the last year, uh, over the last few years, is really pushing for a bilateral trade deal with the United States. And uh, a couple of months ago, um, after many, 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 many years of resistance, Taiwan has said that it will allow uh, the import of U.S. pork and beef uh, back into Taiwan, which hopefully should be a way for um, uh, negotiations for a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement of some sort. We haven't actually seen any real official development, but we've seen a lot of high-level um, exchange between the two sides, and I think this really kind of does bode well. Um, there is a lot of concern, though, amongst Taiwanese, and I think, Jag, you, you can really expand on this, but Taiwan has um, really kind of benefited in many respects from Trump's uh, very um, um, hostile China policy. And there's a lot of concern in Taipei at the moment that perhaps Biden would not be as forceful towards uh, Beijing and um, the robust relations that Taiwan has with the United States might actually decline. So that's, there's a lot of concern in Taipei about that at the moment. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and more, you know, all, all trade and, and economic deals are political, as, as you well know, but it becomes even more the case with Taiwan, you've talked about China's role as essentially a gatekeeper to RCEP and it would be a gatekeeper to TPP or CPTPP if China were to get into that. And even if China's not in it, it has leverage with a bunch of the uh, member states of CPTPP that, that they could easily play to say, keep Taiwan out until China's in, and then once China's in, it gets in the way. Um, but in, in terms of the reaction to uh, President Tsai of, of Taiwan, her uh, unilateral concessions, as it were, on, on beef and pork along Nettle some issue because of that obscure uh, additive ractopamine, among other things. 
Actually, the, the Chinese is much more comprehensible. It translates as uh, skinny meat powder, basically. That's oh. designed for your meat. It's a sorrel jing. Um, but yeah, but, this, it, but there was a big backlash in Taiwan, partly out of health concerns and partly, of course, out of protectionism for, for local uh, producers. Um, and, and there have been issues with Taiwan's own exports. But I think you're right, the, the, the politics of it, it hangs quite heavy. And there is, at least to my mind, a kind of um, over-enthusiasm for Trump and over-concern uh, about Biden in terms of what it means for, um, for Taiwan. I mean, on, on the one hand, uh, yes, there may be some uh, retrenchment from Taiwan benefiting from a particularly sour U.S.-China relationship, although the U.S.-China relationship is not going to improve tons under Biden. But what you do have with the Biden administration is an administration that is at least in principle more open uh, to trade deals uh, and, and less bashing of mm -hmm. trade partners. Taiwan was able to escape that action because it just wasn't high visibility enough. But you know, it's, it's got its own trade issues with the U.S., which are not just pork and beef. It's about trade balances and other things. Um, but it sort of does lead to the question of how much the U.S. is going to be prepared to do to deal with anyone on trade deals going forward. Uh, yes, we've heard a lot from the Biden administration about being more open to this, about rejoining the world and its various institutions, including the WTO, and which it hasn't formally opted out of, but which the U.S. has been you know, actively kneecapping <laughs> for the last uh, <laughs> two years. Uh, but the question is, how much slack do you think uh, and or how much political capital is the Biden administration going to be able or willing to expend on this front? So, you know, people like you and me, we sit around and talk about this and how the TPP uh, the withdrawal from the TPP was the biggest unforced error in American uh, international economic policy with nasty security consequences because the TPP was the economic leg for the pivot to Asia on the security side for the free and open Indo-Pacific alliance of democracies and to knock the economic leg out was terrible. But let's face it, the TPP was in deep trouble during the Obama administration. It was not having a good time getting through Congress. So it wasn't just a Trump thing. Uh, Hillary Clinton as well, uh, ostensibly was anti-TPP, although she might have found a way to get some face-saving changes, but officially uh, was opposed to it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is not a moment when it seems like uh, there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm for free trade agreements uh, in the United States, certainly anything that needs to go through the Congress. And you look at it, really, the last significant new free trade deal we did was Korea. And that was quite a while ago. I mean, the USMCA is a tweaking of NAFTA. You know, there are a few other little things here and there, but we've not been very active in this space. And if you've got a, a, an administration that's coming to office, partly talking a little bit of economic populism, right? The need to protect American jobs, the need to build at home. Does any of that create space or a framework for the US getting back in the game? Uh, and as some would urge, the US getting back into CPTPP, so maybe we can make it back to TPP and it's fewer letters at least. That, is there any hope on that front? Um, in Asia, um, in East Asia in particular, there's a lot of concern about uh, Biden might talk a good talk about uh, recognizing the importance of Asia, uh, really wanting to adopt, uh, for lack of a better way to express it, a the rebalance 2.0, the continuation of the rebalance to Asia under the Obama administration. Um, but um, there's a lot of concern that that's all going to be talk and there isn't going to be a lot of action. And I think there's, there could be potential action on two fronts. Um, one is on the trade front, and but, which I'm not very hopeful about. Um, the trade front, uh, because there isn't a lot of appetite um, for CPTPP. If it was unpopular uh, during the last election cycle, then it's become even more difficult to sell to an America that has really been hit hard by this pandemic. Um, and although, you know, I could argue, you and I, we could argue about the, the need for a CPTPP and it would be a critical pillar for a US um, economic as well as um, foreign policy. Um, the fact of the matter is that not only are the voters um, really more hostile towards globalization, uh, there isn't a lot of appetite in Congress, uh, trade promotion authority, which will allow um, fast tracking of trade deals by the administration is going to run out next summer. Um, and, and also, I, I guess one of the problems is going to be that there has been a lot of talk about domestic 
um, reform and, and investing in America. So Biden's economic pillar, his, his real deal is going to be about uh, delivering all the Build Back Better slogan. And he's already talked about Buy America um, initiatives. And there's a lot of concern that that is almost um, like a uh, Make America Great Again, but with a more uh, kinder conciliatory approach uh, to a more protectionist approach for the United States. So that's one of the concerns um, moving forward. But I do want to point out that there is great opportunity because there's a lot of anger towards China right now, all over the world. And it's not, see, it, it's not abstract, it's not about tariffs, it's not about um, you know, open trade, fair trade. It actually is about some of the economic retaliation that China imposes. So right now what's in the headlines in Australia is uh, you know, China really pummeling Australian imports of wine, of lobster, of barley, of all sorts of things because uh, there was a lot of fake news going on about Australia's involvement in, in Afghanistan. There's been a lot of bad blood about Australia saying that China, we should really investigate into how the coronavirus emerged from, from China. And so China's taking this very strong arm approach to, to um, tackle and fight back against China, uh, to, against Australia. Um, we haven't seen a lot of concerted effort, um, international support for Australia. We've seen some tweets from all sorts of other capitals, including the United States and the NSC, uh, saying that this is a really bad approach by China, but we haven't seen a concerted approach to it. I think this really does open an opportunity for the United States to lead the way to say that China is acting like a bad actor. We need to really kind of uh, coordinate our action as an international community. Um, and the Australia example is only one of many. We've seen, you know, for instance, uh, China pushing back against um, Korea when um, uh, Korea adopted the THAAD uh, defense network on, on uh, Korean soil, ostensibly for its own protection, but China thought very much that it was against China, and so it took retaliatory measures, economic um, punitive economic actions towards China, uh, towards Korea on that front. We've seen China take punitive action against Japan uh, for the tr uh, territorial disputes by uh, restricting exports of rare earth, that rare earth material that um, China dominates in. All of these things, there are opportunities for the um, you know, like-minded countries to come together um, and I think that would be a pretty low lift for the United States. It does not need to have any you know, legislation to go behind it, um, but it will also say, signal that America is back and that it wants to lead the world with the values of you know, transparency and going against fake news and going against um, unilateralism. Um, and, I, and I hope very much that the Biden administration will take some concrete steps um, in a very short window of opportunity to give confidence to Asian countries to say that America is back and, is, and America is committed to uh, stability in Asia. And I think that's an important set of points and it's an important counter to the narrative of RCEP as being this great Chinese victory. As you pointed out, it's an awesome creation originally, of course. Uh, and there's some chafing within the region where everybody's saying it's a Chinese-led uh, trade pack and, 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 and so on. But whatever the origin story, uh, we're worried about the consequences. And the, I think you know, the point well taken is that uh, this is not a simple victory for China. It's a sense of victory in the kind of big competition with the U.S. because the TPP, which of course was not U.S. initiated but gets described as U.S.-led, um, was going to be on one side with one cluster of countries overlapping with <clears throat> the cluster of countries in the, the China-centric RCEP. The question is how much good does it do going forward? And, and I think that's an important, again, set of points about the distrust of China uh, within the region, uh, partly a distrust of its motives, obviously amplified by China's 
growing clout. Uh, but the really important economic political link here is the sense that uh, China does use economic leverage to political ends. And of course, all countries do, but China has been a little more bare knuckled uh, about that uh, uh, in a way that has really um, scared uh, everybody from Australia up to Japan, actually from India through Australia all the way up to Japan, uh, where there's a sense of vulnerability, political vulnerability that comes from economic dependence on China. I think there's a real um, a uh, bit of confidence building China would need to do to overcome that. Uh, so as much as that makes a very important point about the link between economics and security, and of course it's gotten even more robust as we see security issues in every economic relationship, whether it's 5G or TikTok or whatever. But the other side of that story in terms of how the U.S. counters this has been that the U.S. has been at risk of essentially taking a sucker's bet in Asia. Right? That is, China does the economic integration, the U.S. foots a good chunk of the security bill, countries want U.S. support against possible Chinese aggression, uh, but uh, we risk ceding the economic uh, field, which matters a great deal in the region to China, and the RCEP is another step in that story. So, so how do we either deal with that narrative or maybe put the real policy underpinnings that would make that narrative less plausible in place? The complaint was the pivot was hollow without the TPP. FOIP, you know, free and open Indo-Pacific policy is largely a security and politics thing. The few economic things mixed in, but it's not really that robust. So I take your point about there's a lot of low hanging fruit for the Biden administration to reap, but is that gonna be enough to satisfy actors in the region about the economic uh, leg that they think the US has to put under this, lest it be purely a security story where there are doubts about how robust it'll be. Well, the reality is that China is the biggest trading partner for almost all countries in the region, including Japan and, and Korea. And they don't necessarily want that to change. They don't want to say that, no, it should be the United States again, that is their biggest trading partner. So I, th I think we need to step back and think about what it is that they want. Um, what they want actually is really to be able to decouple uh, the economic interests and security interests. And I think we're going to see a lot of you know, different coalitions forming. We'll see like an economic coalition um, and those are easily going to be defined by trade rules and trade regimes. And so we could see RCEP as one of them, but we will see um, a political coalition as well. Um, you know, the Biden administration is already talking about having a summit of the democracies. Um, and, and so we'll see a gathering with, with the United States kind of leading the way on that. And then we'll see more of a coalition on the security front and certainly the United States in front and center of that. The real question is, okay, is will the United States be satisfied with that? Because I think a lot of the Asian countries would actually be very comfortable with that arrangement. And there are a few countries that would be able to have a coalition on the economic as well as security and political front that align completely with the United States. Okay, uh, lest people think that Shehoko and I have been uh, mo uh, monopolizing <laughs> or, or oligopolizing this, I guess it's the two of us, uh, much of what we've been talking about here actually does integrate a lot of the questions that have come in the chat box and we're keeping that or the Q&A box rather, we keep an eye on that as we go forward. Uh, so I think we've answered a bunch of them, but let me pick up a few that we haven't uh, fully uh, gotten to. Um, uh, so one question at the top here is, how would you advise the CEO of a Fortune 500 company to position his or her company to have access to the vast market represented by the RCEP countries? And, and this is, of course, is something that comes up almost any time you have one of these FTA type arrangements, free trade type arrangements uh, come up in, in place. It, if, if you're not, if your country's not in it, uh, you, pay, you face potentially some significant problems in export competition, right? You face tariffs and RO rules of origin and things like that in the way, uh, which of course can create an incentive to jump the tariff, uh, to go and if you're a transnational uh, corporation, go and set up shop in an entity inside uh, the free trade area. So the national and corporate interests don't align all that, that neatly in many cases. Uh, so, so if we look more at the, at the company side, aside from uh, jumping the barrier and producing inside an RCEP country, uh, and that may be a big part of the answer, but that part of the answer plus any other you want to add about, about how companies cope with the possible consequences of, of American companies uh, cope with the consequences of being outside 
uh, the bubble. Yeah, so I mean, the big challenge is less for the Fortune 500 companies, right? Especially if they have that opportunity and that capacity to, to be able to relocate within the RCEP, um, uh, 15, the 15 member countries of RCEP. It's the small sized and medium sized companies. And it's also exporters like agricultural producers that have no option but to grow their stuff um, at home and then export to to the RCEP member countries. And, and they will, quite frankly, find it very, very hard to compete. Um, let me give you an example of what happened after the United States left, R uh, RCEP, um, left TPP. U.S. agriculture suffered tremendously uh, because the 11 countries actually started reducing their tariffs on agricultural imports. And so if you went to Japan, and you went to a supermarket, it was flooded with Australian beef and New Zealand uh, lamb and, and Canadian strawberries and all of these things. And American products would come in, but they would face that markup through his tariffs. They couldn't compete. And so last year, um, I, I went to give a presentation at the, the annual USDA exporters kind of summit meeting. And they were describing to me that usually they talk about you know, how the government, the US government should try to um, eliminate barriers and act on its behalf when it goes overseas. And this was a big jamboree to talk about you know, what, what, what they expect from USG. But that year, in 2019, really the talk was about how can we get the United States to join CPTPP or how can we get the United States to have bilateral free trade agreements with countries like Japan. And then at the end, what happened was that the United States ended up having a bilateral trade agreement with Japan, which was essentially um, very similar to what was outlined in the CPTPP. So uh, American agriculture did not suffer um, uh, compared to their Australian and, and New Zealand and Canadian counterparts that were competing in that same market. So I can anticipate the United States trying to do a bilateral deal with some of the member countries of RCEP that it doesn't already have a trade deal with, but that's a very piecemeal approach. And again, the beauty of RCEP is this comprehensiveness and the United States is out of that comprehensiveness. It's out of the comprehensiveness of the CPTPP. Um, and so although it never will have the opportunity to be part of RCEP, it does have that opportunity to be part of CPTPP. And I would encourage businesses to really make a case for the United States to join CPTPP much more loudly than they did for TPP, because the failure, one of the failures of the Obama administration had been really to focus too much on the geopolitic, geopolitical side and not enough about um, you know, what does it mean for American businesses and what does it mean for American consumers? That argument really needs to be heard. One uh, specific uh, question about RCEP, which I don't know the answer to anymore, right, is uh, does it deal with uh, Bitcoin and other sort of crypto no. transactions? No. It no, sounds like the bridge too far for something which barely got into e-commerce. Yeah, um, I, I mean, we don't, they, they don't even do state-owned enterprises. It's just one of those things where you cannot get a consensus between countries like Cambodia with Singapore, so. Right. And of course, complicated by this sort of electronic yuan, which is not really a, 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 a cryptocurrency, but seeks to displace some of it, but, but is, is way more government controlled. So I think a lot of that's unfolding and that, the sort of second or third generation set of questions. Um, so it's getting a little bit outside our core focus here. We have a couple of questions. I think that they come in the category sort of related to our discussion about US corporations a moment ago. They come in the category of uh, will either side use um, uh, leverage to exercise a sort of political ability to affect uh, commerce in a way that will uh, be problematic for US-China relations. So one question is, you know, are we going to see China engaged in uh, not buying Boeing aircraft? Um, uh, and are we going, uh, and on the other hand, are we going to see a Biden administration uh, because of its renewed emphasis on, on sort of the human rights democracy side of things, are we going to see it being tougher on the export of U.S. surveillance technology and other sort of tools of authoritarian rule if they're deployed to that? Do you see that kind of politics of economic relations coming back uh, more forcefully than we've seen it recently? Uh, 
You mean like on U.S.-China relations, right? This Primarily U.S.-China, yeah, I think that, that's, that's what both these questions are focused on. Are we going to see China doing, we saw some of this under Trump, right, the, the stop buying soybeans, uh, uh, sort of, the, the, so, are, are, you know, now that we, the, are, there's a lot of stuff going on, but is that old story still going to be with us and is going to become more prominent again, do you think? China using political purchases, which we talked about a little bit on the on the like export control side, and you see the U.S. getting tougher on exporting technology that is not so much a direct threat to U.S. security, but a threat to human rights and and you know freedoms around the world because of the surveillance technology China uses domestically and sells to others. I mean, it's really difficult to go into the what you know, what specific actions the Biden administration will pursue. But we do know that Biden said a number of times that he has no plans to immediately uh, uh, get rid of the tariffs that were imposed by the Trump administration, including um, the tariffs imposed on China. So we can probably expect him to not add new tariffs, uh, but to at least for a while keep with the tariffs that are currently in, in place. Um, and I think that's not just on China, but perhaps also on, on the steel um, and aluminium um, products as well. Um, that is imposed not just on China, but on some of uh, America's biggest um, allies, um, including those in Europe and in Asia as well. So long as that holds, I cannot expect China, I mean, you know this better than I do, I can't expect China to actually like retaliate and say, no, it's a new administration, you should like uh, do something about it. But I think if the Biden administration were to take further action, um, there could be a lot more kind of attention that that builds up. Uh, so we're running up against uh, time here. I'll just say that I think you know it's a venerable part of the Chinese toolkit uh, to use selective uh, purchases to reward and punish. That's been around a long time. I don't see it ratcheting up, but as you said, that's part of what fuels concern among the other RCEP members about how uh, China will behave. We we'll squeeze in one last uh, question that, that came in on the chat, and then we'll close it out. Which is: um, Is the RCEP a boon for China's attempt to make the yen an important international currency? Uh, possibly ultimately being a reserve currency to rival the U.S. I mean, it helps put more trade in a kind of China-centric world. There's not a direct link, but is, is, is it, a, is it a, a boon or a bane for that or neither? I mean, is, does it add to that whole package? Does it add to the AIIB and the BRI? Yeah, it, it adds further uh, to the power of the yuan. And so, yes, that could lead to it. But of course, that really depends uh, much more on the IMF, and I, I think there is a lot of um, talk about, yeah, uh, the yuan. The yuan's um, influence is, is is on the rise, I think, and and uh, perhaps even more through our set. So on that bit of what foreign currencies you should hold, <laughs> we'll close. <laughs> I want to thank Shihoko for a, a really terrific and uh, engaging and, and fact-packed and analysis-packed uh, hour. Uh, we've come up against the end of our time. I'll throw it back to Raleigh to close this out in a moment, but I'll put in a quick plug for a few Asia program things we've got uh, coming up. We're going to be having a discussion with uh, the Taiwan representative, the sort of ambassador equivalent, on U.S.-Taiwan uh, relations uh, in trade and uh, the impact of COVID and all of that. That's coming up in January. We'll be doing a session around the same time on what U.S. foreign policy toward Asia is likely to look like under a Biden administration, which will come into office on January 20th. And uh, later into the spring, we'll have a couple of book talks uh, for FPRI-related outputs. One uh, book that Avery Goldstein, who's a senior fellow as well as a colleague of mine at Penn and I are doing on after engagement uh, U.S.-China security relations. I am uh, the one that uh, Raleigh mentioned at the top which is on Taiwan under Tsai uh, which I've co-edited with our senior fellow June Teufel Dreyer. Uh, so we've run a little bit over here. It's apologies for that. Thank you again Joko and I'll throw it back to Raleigh to close this out. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, th thanks, Jock and Shihoko. That was terrific. A complex uh, topic made understandable and a topic that I don't think gets enough attention. So thank you for that. Um, 
before we go, I just want to uh, give a reminder when you registered, you should have received when you logged on a feedback form. We read those, we sometimes respond to you on those, and we always take them under advisement and things like the maps and the chats are a direct result of your feedback. So please, please keep it coming. And thank you again to our sponsors and members. If you're not a member, check us out, www.fpri.org. Uh, consider becoming a member and uh, thank you again and please stay safe and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Take care.